All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Tyler Rodriguez. I'm a reference and instruction librarian here at the U of I, and thank you for coming to our graduate essential workshop series. Today, what we're going to go over are six questions to ask before publishing your journal article. Okay, so get started. Generally, what are the six questions that we're going to cover? So today, we're going to talk about what publishing models you should pursue, what and how do you find a relevant journal? What are the submission guidelines? What can you expect from a peer review process? What are your rights as an author? And then how can you track the impact of your work once you are published? So we'll go ahead and dive in to those publishing models. There are three main ones that we're gonna talk about today. The first, probably the most familiar to you is the subscription or the toll access journals. Those are articles that are published for journals that people are paying to have access to. So here, that's us, right? The institution U of I pays access for you to locate these articles and journals. Um, this year in 2023, the average price for a health science journal was $2,752. So not very cheap to pay for access for that. And, and they just get higher, especially in the STEM fields. Like a chemistry journal is gonna run you more on the end of like 7,200 and some dollars, right? Even your humanities journals that are generally the less expensive ones are still gonna be over $500 a subscription. So it's, it's quite a lot. And while you're here as a student, you get all of that access. We cover that bill. So that's very, very nice. And that's one subscription or publishing model that you see. Another one that is becoming more and more popular is a fully open access journal. So this is when every article published in that journal is free to anyone, anywhere, forever, right? Like I said, you're gonna see a much, a larger movement towards this in higher education and academia because knowledge is power. We should have access to knowledge, right? So some of these fully open access journals do charge you an article processing fee for publishing with them. And you can figure out um, what that fee will cost through the directory of open access journals. So here um, we can search for journal titles or in just a specific field. So let's take a look at some fine art journals. Like with any database that you search, you can use limiters on the side. So we can go ahead and, and just see ones that don't charge those article processing fees. We can also look at different subjects or languages, things like that. And when you find a journal, you can click in to see more information about it. So the tape papers, they don't have an article processing charge. So these are, are free to submit. And this page gives you a lot of helpful information about the journal, including links to their scope, when they started or became an open access, what kind of um, open licenses they use. We'll get into that a little bit later and where they are, which can be super helpful. But we can also, I'm just gonna go back this way because my little zoom bar makes it difficult. If we're looking for a specific journal, you can do that as well. So this is ReadyMatch or the Journal of Research in Mathematics Education. And here we can see that they do charge an article processing fee of 484 euros, so about like 515 US dollars, give or take the day, right? So these fees are a one-time cost fee that the authors pay to ensure that their article is open access. And these fees you can cover yourself, but here at U of I, you have a couple funding options available to you. Uh, one being here through the library, we have the open access publishing fund. So you can go to the library website and you can learn a little bit more about this fund, the history, the eligibility, how you apply, requirements of that nature. So this is a fund that is available to you as grad students to take advantage of, but you also get, sorry for all of the clicking, 
as grad students, you do have access to the Graduate and Professional Students Association Publishing Award. This is a once a year $700 award that you can also use to publish in an open access journal. So this is intended to cover those um, article processing fees, right? And then a kind of blended model of those two is the hybrid open access. So this is a mix where some of the articles in this journal are open access and are freely available. Others are only available to those who subscribe and pay um, the subscription costs. So for these publishing models, the author is given the option of whether they would like to pay to publish their article open or not. Um, these tend to be more expensive even than the fully open access journals. For instance, like Wiley's Advanced Biology Journal, that article processing charge is $4,220. So that's that's quite a bit different. Um, but there are benefits. Um, you are still publishing open access. Your article is accessible to, to everyone. And then it also means that it is in um, journals that do have subscription fees. So your, your audience might be a little bit larger. That journal might have been around a lot more or have some kind of academic affiliation, which could be helpful. So you really just wanna take into consideration your field, your research, when picking which publishing model that you like to pursue. For the hybrid, our library open access publishing fund doesn't support that mode of publishing, but double check with um, the UI grad fund that might just make sure you read the fine print. We'll go over that a couple of times today. You always wanna read, read the fine print for journals, right? So along with the publishing models, you do need to know how do you find a journal, right, that you would like to publish in. Uh, one of the neat, cool ways that I like to do is look at your colleagues. So here at the University of Idaho, currently we have Vivo, and on this you can locate different other faculty members, areas of research, and you can actually see what they have published before, what journals that they have published in. We're going to be advancing this system soon to a much cooler tool, but Vivo still gives you a lot of really helpful information about what your colleagues are publishing in. Your other option are some different online sources, right? Journal citation reports is a great resource um, when you're looking to find um, journals kind of ranked by their impact. So if we go down here, we can look at a different journal uh, list and see their journal impact factor. This is this JIF number. Now these numbers have different contextual meaning within their field. So it's, it's really important not necessarily to look at the number itself, but look at the order that these journals are ranked in the list. And this is very similar. You can filter for your subject areas. Now, this journal citation reports doesn't index all of the journals within a discipline, but it is a good um, place to start. They do have, you know, 21,000 journals. It's a good place to start. Other options are the Web of Science Master Journal List. And this again, um, you can search by journal, by title, and this, this also has a match manuscript tool. So if you're really uncertain of what potentially could be a good fit, you can upload some of the information about the article you're writing and get matched with a potential journal. Like any electronic system, there are some glitches. It might take some fine tuning, make sure you're clearing your cache and your cookies kind of thing. But I've had some success with locating journals this way. You can also use Ulrich Global Serials directly. This does index all of the journals that are currently out, as well as those who have published before but are no longer around. So this is a very comprehensive list. And this could be good um, to do some kind of historical research about what other things have been published in your field, what journals are still active and relevant. So this is a really good tool. Also though, besides your friends and online, you're doing research yourself. So the journals you read could be a great place to start looking to publish in, right? You, you tend to learn a lot more about those journals. You can look at um, 
you know, what they've submitted in the past to see if you're a good fit for them. You can email the editors. We'll take a look. I've highlighted here the New England Review. So you can go to any journal's website. So you can find them in the directories and then investigate them further. A lot of the directories, directories will link out to you, but we can take a look here and learn quite a lot about different journals. The about page, generally, their mission is a good thing to read through, their history. You can get to know their masthead, so people who work there. Sometimes you can email editors and say, hey, you know, I have this article that I'm working on, this idea that I'm interested in publishing. Do you think potentially this would be a fit for your journal? You know, your success rate with hearing back will depend, but you can always try. So you can learn a whole lot. And you can also, on the journals, learn more about their submission guidelines, right? Each journal is going to have very, very specific guidelines. I highly, highly recommend, though, really starting with the mission and focus. I've worked in the publishing industry for quite a bit, and met journals and magazines get a lot of submissions that aren't actually fit their scope or what they serve to publish. And so that is like my number one takeaway. Read the mission statement. Look at what they've done before and make sure that that's a good fit for you and you're not wasting your time crafting your submission to a journal that it doesn't quite, it's just not going to be a good fit for them. And the submission requirements vary by journal, right? So um, you have things like single submission versus multiple. And what that means, a single submission is that you can only submit your article to be considered to publication to one journal. So they don't want you submitting it to another journal and like potentially competing, right? Multiple would allow you to do that. Oftentimes you see a lot of single submissions. They want to consider your stuff first. They don't want to find you and love you and then email you and you've already been accepted somewhere else, right? Also important is whether the submission is required to be anonymized or not. So that includes mentions in the text to yourself, to your institution or the region potentially, but also the actual document itself needs to be anonymized. So if we're working in a Word doc, a lot of times people don't realize, you know, you're signed in to all of your syncing accounts because you never want to lose your work or your data. And what that means is if you create a document and you're, you know, doing your stuff, that also means your name is attached even without your intention sometimes, just because you're saving your work. So what you have to actually do before submitting to a journal is you need to inspect the actual document itself as well. So what this does is after we have saved it, because that's also important, is it runs through and checks all these different areas of your documents. So you just want to leave everything checked, including links if you have it. And this is going to run through all of the hidden text as well as the text itself. And you can see here, it says that the document has um, author properties on it, which to be anonymized, we need to get rid of. So we're going to just remove all of those. And then it's always a good idea to reinspect just to make sure that the technology works the way that you intended it to. And now we can see that there's no, no hits. There's no information in this document. And when we go over, we should be able to see I'm no longer there. So I'm no longer attached to this document in any capacity. So that's very, very important when it comes to anonymizing a document. Here. Also, um, journals will tell you specifically what citation to use and if you need an ORCID ID. And an ORCID ID is something that helps journals identify who you are as an author. So this is a free service that you can, you can register for and create an ORCID ID. Not all journals require you to have one, but it is a good idea. You know, you, you want to claim your work and you want to be able to be found easily. So it's always a good idea to go ahead and, and start 
with an ORCID ID before you consider publishing anywhere. Now, when you're selecting a journal, like I said, everything will be very specific to what they are looking for. So always go ahead and double check. A lot of journals have guidelines for their authors that you can run through as almost like a checklist. Make sure, you know, the font is correct. Some journals will want headings in the document rather than just, you know, bulleted points. Um, the citation style will change. And it's always important to craft your article for the journal that you're intending to publish in. So I highly recommend doing this research and locating a journal almost before you get started writing your actual article, because it's going to tell you what sections need. So this is the Harvard Educational Review. And we can see here that, you know, we can learn a lot more about what they've published, what they're looking for. You know, they tell you specifically that the research related to education should be included, such as the background and context or theoretical conceptual framework. It needs to have a literature review and a method section, finding and analysis and discussion. All of those need to be in your article in order to even be considered. So that's obviously we need that information when we get into writing it. And the author guide will also tell you a lot about the citation styles or any kind of interesting things that the journal is asking you for. So your articles are definitely written to be published at least the first time with one journal in mind. And if you don't get selected for publication, that might mean also that you need to go through and edit or change your article in some capacity in order to resubmit it for another journal. So it's just, it's a process, right? It's not, it's more of an art than a science when it comes to getting published in a journal. But say you've, you've found a journal that you're really interested in, you've crafted, oops, sorry, you've crafted your article, you're ready to submit, you've submitted it with your ORCID ID and your account, and now you've reached the peer review process. There are a couple of different types of peer review out there. The journals will also tell you generally in the article guide or the author guide what peer review style they use. So a single blind peer review is when your identity um, is known to the reviewers, but you don't know who the reviewers are. So only you, your information is blind. A double blind means both that your information and the reviewer information is not known. Nobody knows who anybody is. This is considered kind of like the gold standard or the aim for a lot of journals. And this is to remove bias, right? We don't want to have affiliation or institution or personal histories be involved. This is about the research. This is about the work that you've done, right? Transparent means it could go in hand with a single or a double blind peer review. And what that transparent means that all of the edits or the suggestions that have come back from the reviewers, from the editors, your response to those reviewers and editors could be published alongside the accepted article. So the audience can kind of see the changes that have gone through the publication process. Still could be anonymous to begin with. This is all at publication. But if you find a journal that does use a transparent peer review process, that's incredibly helpful because you know then in advance maybe some potential changes or edits that they're looking for in their articles. And then open is everybody knows everybody, right? The readers know, the um, reviewers know, um, it's published along with the article who everybody is so the readers can also contact the reviewers or the editors. Collaborative could mean a couple of different things. It could mean that the reviewers are still anonymous to you, but they can they collaborate together to give you that um, review report for suggestions. But it could also mean that the reviewers collaborate with you on the article before acceptance. This is incredibly helpful. Um, you know, if this is your first article or you're just trying to get published and you're still learning a lot about the process, the reviewers work with you through that um, to do the edit piece. So that's you know, a good option to look for journals that have that if that's something you're interested in. Results free is also a really cool, interesting way that we see peer review um, 
things published. So what this means is when you submit your article, the editors and reviewers are blinded to your study results, right? They don't see your initial findings in that first stage. This is helpful potentially if the results you found um, were negative or not what you thought they would be or unintentional. This can be helpful to kind of remove again that bias of, of what the outcomes were and really look at the research that you did and the method that you conducted your research in. And then if it's accepted, you'll upload the full article with the results for the reviewers and the editors to go through. And, and just double check that your, your, your methodologies match, that the conclusions were justified, and everything is cohesive. What we're seeing sometimes now, uh, it's not as popular, but also a post-publication peer review. And this is when your article is published, but it also has an element of a discussion board or a blog style where the readers themselves can also interact with your article and give you feedback. Again, super cool if you find a journal that does this, if you're new and starting out and creating those kind of connections, that network for maybe even potential articles that you could collaborate with someone. Um, and that's a way that you could, again, find a journal or find someone to collaborate with you right? You can also be reviewers for journals. So I got an email um, at the beginning of this week from my alma mater of SJSU. They were looking for reviewers for their post-grad um, journal article. So those calls will come out on listserv, listservs, but also from the journals themselves. On their website, you might see calls for reviewers. Again, that's a great opportunity for you to learn more about the other side of the publishing, which just aids you when you go to publish as well. I always find it incredibly interesting to see what other people are working on. And that usually gets me more passionate about my research topics. And then you're also staying in the know of what's going on. So it's really helpful if a journal you specifically like, or you've read a lot of the research that comes out of maybe seeing what their peer review process is and if they have an open call for reviewers. So we found a journal. We've anonymized, we've submitted, we've gone through the rigor of the peer review process, we've been accepted for publishing, and now it's time to negotiate our rights, right? So your rights as an author, everything you do in any stage is copyright. Whether it's your notebook, your computer, any content you create is automatically copyright, right? You own access to how that information is displayed publicly. When you are being published in a journal, you are transferring your copyright to the journal. So they now have the right to publicly promote your work, right? So this is done through a copyright transfer agreement. We'll take a look at an example here. So this um, is for the Journal of the Optical Society of America. And you can see there's a lot of fine print. This is a legally binding document. Read it all, <laughs> top to front, right? This is giving the journal the right to publish your work. And it also tells you what you can do with your right after it's published, your work, what your rights are with your work after it's published. So for this one, we can see that the author maintains the right to use the materials in a classroom or in an educational setting. We can also see that they can upload it to a um, personal server or a website. Oftentimes with journals, you'll see some of the rights will be in here that you have an embargo. So you can't post it on your website for a year. And that's so that people visit the actual journal to read your article, right? But then after a year, it's still your work. You can publish it. These legal documents are often pretty firm, but they there is room for negotiation. So you can, you know, fight for some more rights as, um, as the author. So if we look here, a good website to kind of help um, understand more about that process is Spark. Spark is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resource Coalition. So the work of this organization is to make sure that we're all doing our due diligence 
and protecting ourselves. So they have this author amendment set up where you can kind of walk through and look at different ways that you could potentially negotiate your author rights after being accepted for publication. This site has a lot of helpful information for authors. I highly recommend um, taking a look through this. Um, you guys will get a handout with all of these links after, after the workshop. So this is an, an incredibly powerful tool to have in your pocket because this agreement um, also tells you um, what other people can do with your work. So when you publish open, um, copyright could be a little bit different and it gets a Creative Commons license. So this is, is again, what I what people can also do with your work in an open journal. Typically, um, there are different types of licenses, but almost all require that you, all of them do require that you attribute the author. So someone can use your article, but they must give you credit for it, copyright. That's the whole reason it exists. A lot of open resources will also have a share alike which means they they have to attribute to you and they have to also, whatever they generate, whatever they publish, they need to also publish openly and publish with a share alike. Um, so Creative Commons walks you through all the different types of these open publishing license and what they mean. And like I said, this informs people on what they can do with your work after you've published it openly. A lot of these copyright agreements and the author's guide also gives you content and information on sharing and self-archiving your work, when and what happens with your copyright, those cookies, you gotta watch out for them. So the guide for author is definitely something that you wanna download and save. It has tons of information, even more of that fine print, right? It's gonna walk you through the review process. It's gonna walk you through different copyright, different changes if something happens, like maybe you change your name, what that process looks like, their policies. It's all gonna be in that author guide. So if we look at copyrights, we can see as an author, you have certain rights to rescue your work and it'll walk us through so in Elsevier, if you publish with the journal by them, what can happen? What can you do with your article afterwards? What they do with it? If you publish open, these are the rights you retain. If you publish in their subscription model, these are the rights you get retain. So we see there's a little bit of a difference. So always, always check the author guide. You want to know all of your rights and all of the fine print before you get to that publication stage. You don't want any surprises when it comes to the end time. Along with copyright, you're gonna see a lot of different language about the version of your article because the copyright can change depending on what version you're speaking about. So the author's original version, the manuscript, the preprint or submitted version is the document that you upload, right? It's all of your work. Generally, journals don't care a whole lot about this version. They've not invested any time or resources into it. So a lot of the times you, you can do what you want with this version. Sometimes there will be an embargo, like I said, like, hey, just wait a year before you do anything with it. But generally you have the most permissions with this version. And then you move to the accepted version or the post print. This is going to be the the version of the article that you've worked with the reviewers and the editors to, to edit and to clean up, but maybe it's missing some formatting or final touches that go into the article before print. These articles often that you're allowed to post them, but the journals want you to link to the final version so that other people can see the final version of the work in the journal subscription. And then proof sometimes is another word that you can see thrown out this this might be a copy of your article that includes the copy edits, but again, it's just missing some like maybe a graphic or some final touches. It could also be the same as that accepted version. Proof is used a lot more with books or like larger works, but it's something to be aware of. 
And then you have the version of record or the final version, the publisher version. This is the article in its complete final form. This is exactly what it'll look like in the journal or the online version. And this, if not open, is public, the publisher won't allow you to share this copy, right? This is their copy. They've put in all of this time and, and resource to work on this article. And, and this is this is the version that they want more control of access to. So after you've done this whole process, right? You did it, you're published, congratulations. You've had a party to celebrate. It's really, really exciting. Now it comes to tracking your impact. So the more you advance in your field, the more you wanna keep an eye on what impact your work is having. There's a couple different levels and ways that we can track this impact. You can look at the journal itself. So we talked about that journal impact factor. Um, that number tells you how impactful the journal is in its field. And you, you can look at that and that's ranked within the discipline and that's helpful. But probably what you're more interested in because you, you've done that work in advance when you've selected your journal is the article level. So there's a couple of different ways to track your article level. Citation counts is probably the most well-known one. And you can do this through Web of Science. You can also do it through things like Google Scholar, which is your friend. So we can see right here that this article has been cited by 281 people. It's a 2010. That's pretty good, right? Don't get, you know, don't worry about your citation counts. Those tend to build as the research builds, right? It takes time to conduct research, to build on research. So these can be a slow moving kind of number. Another way you can track your article impact outside of the citation counts are um, alt metrics. So alt metrics look at the record of attention that your article has, getten, has, has gotten, sorry, um, where it's been disseminated to, and, and what kind of influence and impact it's having in the field. So if we look at this second article, we can see this is a Taylor and Francis online for higher education research and development journal. And we can actually look straight away at the metrics. So we can see how many um, views that this article has gotten as well as the citation and the alt metric. So this tells us that eight people have tweeted about it. It's got 367 readers on Mendeley and the alt metric score is five. So if we click in to alt metrics, we don't at U of I have like an institutional login to alt metrics, um, but it is a free site that you can look things on. There's also um, an alt metrics bookmarklet that you can add to your web browser to kind of see um, the alt metric score for different articles that you're just finding more organically. But we see that the score is five here. So we can check like where in the world that this article is getting a lot of traction, where its readership is. And we can see that score in context, which is pretty important. So we can see that out of the outputs from higher education, research and development, it's ranked 617 out of 1300. We can also see, you know, out of similar age of article, which again is really important because the research takes time, it's ranked number seven. So you can kind of see the, the impact of your work in context to what others are doing in the very same field that you're working in. So this is, this is pretty important and, and it's the context that should matter and help influence how you're tracking. Another way that you can track your impact is you yourself, how you are doing as an author. And one way you track that is through the H index. The H index measures the productivity of your citations with the impact you have as a person. So how you calculate this, we're not loading. So your H factor is actually, it's the number of articles that you've published that have been cited at least the same number of articles that you've published, which sounds kind of confusing. Um, let's, this is actually the one that I wanted to show you. 
So how you calculate is like this. So you rank all of the articles that you've published in citation descending order. And then you calculate, okay, so for this case, we see that this author has published 12 articles and he's published at least eight articles that have been cited at least eight times. So it's the number, like the actual number of articles you've cited and then the lowest citation. So this author's H index is eight, right? So this can just be helpful for you to, to know. You can also, if you don't wanna calculate this manually, again, Web of Science or Scopus can calculate it for you. So if we take a look, we'll do a little call out here and we'll look at the H index for our Dean here at the library. So you can find people and we want here, University of Idaho, Moscow. So we can see his H index is five. So he's published six articles, five of which have at least five citations. So that's his kind of H index, his author count. And you can look at this information, also your citation accounts and create accounts to claim your work in Web of Science, which helps this. You can also do that in Google Scholar, right? If we go to Google Scholar and we search the same way, we can see author profiles, right? And this is kind of more of a common name. You're going to see a lot. But what you can do is, is create an author profile, both on Web of Science and in Google Scholar, and you can claim your work. So people can see um, your H index, your different metrics, how many citations and articles you're writing, which is kind of fun. It's kind of fun to look at and to visibly track your progress as an author. So I know that was a lot of information and we went quickly, but you'll get a handout with all of the links that I clicked on, as well as some more resources to look at this information further. Do you have any questions? about publishing your article, how the process works, things to look out for. No, that's totally fine. You can always email me if you think about questions or if you're curious about something, I'm happy to chat. Also wanted to tell you about some of the other workshops that we have coming up. So here we are, but we do have two more. So a make data, man make data management easier is really important depending on your research field, having a good data management plan from the beginning is incredibly important and incredibly powerful. And also our web mapping for every, every discipline is very interesting. I highly recommend you attend these workshops as well. Great. Well, those are all the questions. Those are all the things I wanted to tell you about. Publishing is fun. It's a little scary, but it's really exciting. And it's a great way to get started. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs>